Last week I was talking about unity, and I said, and I, I don't get misunderstood a lot, but a couple of you may have, I said in that sermon that I'm serving in a place where I don't necessarily agree with the elders or the staff on this issue of uh, female pastors, women in, in just the elder role, that's all we were talking about. And some of you sent sort of conciliatory, I'm sorry, the elders don't support you emails. You misunderstood that. The elders support me. The elders love me. I support the elders. I love the elders. You will not get any space between us ever. But that doesn't mean we agree on everything, and that's okay. But nobody has to feel sorry for me. I love these guys, and one of the reasons I'm here is because I love these guys. And one of the reasons I came here is because of Steve Marston as an executive pastor. We don't have to agree on everything, but we're in this together. And that was the point. So, all right? All right. Thank you, Paul. The feeling yeah. is mutual. So we're taking a little bit of a break from our series on Vintage Church uh, because this is <clears throat> Thanksgiving weekend. Usually Thanksgiving weekend does come with snow, but for me it's usually been the end of November. So this is interesting. I guess the snow just follows the tradition. But I was reading, or I should say I was watching a TED Talk. Some of you are probably familiar with TED Talks and sort of these uh, great learning experiences you can see online. I was watching a TED Talk by a man named David Steindl Rast. I believe that's a, close to his uh, name anyway. And it was about the subject of gratefulness, which I think is synonymous with thankfulness. So I was watching this TED Talk. He began with a simple but powerful uniting principle for all of humanity, and that was this. We all want to be happy, right? I think we'd all agree with that. Everyone wants to be happy, whether they're Christians or non-Christians, regardless of religion, regardless of race, regardless of class. Everyone wants to be happy. It's universal. And I don't think that's necessarily wrong. I don't think God shuns happiness. But we don't all agree on what will get us to happiness. We don't all agree on that. For some people, they think it's the top of the corporate ladder or it's going to be a certain amount of money in their bank accounts. We don't agree on what's going to give us that perfect quality of life, that stamp of approval, that sense that we've arrived. But we all believe when we get there, whatever that is, we're going to be happy and we all want happy. Many people believe wrongly that when you get to the point of happy, that you will also be grateful. That grateful people are people who've sort of achieved enough in life that they're happy and that gratefulness will follow happy. The problem is we all know people who should be very happy and they're not. And yet some of them are very grateful. And so this, just, this connection is not what it would seem. Happiness does not make you grateful but what's interesting, studies are indicating that gratefulness or thankfulness does make you happy. Happiness will not necessarily make you grateful. Reaching some certain status economically or in your profession will not necessarily create gratefulness. But gratefulness or thankfulness, regardless of situation, does actually lead to happiness. There are social studies being done on this all the time. In other words, <clears throat> I would argue, and I think God argues this behind the text, if you will, you can create your way to happiness. You can actually self-manage your way to happiness through habits of thanksgiving and gratefulness. You can, you can manufacture happiness by learning to be grateful for all the things that God has put into your life. Now, thankfulness is commanded by God. It's actually one of the most notable verses in the New Testament on thankfulness is this very short verse we have in 1 Thessalonians 5.18. I'm not going to make you turn there because this is all it is. In everything, give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. That's one of the most notable verses in the Bible, in the New Testament, on this subject. It's set in the middle, or I should say it's the end of a series of sort of postscript admonitions. It's as if Paul says after his letter, P.S., and then he says three quick commands. Rejoice always, pray continually, in everything give thanks. 
sort of like these PSs at the end of his book. They're just sort of standalone statements. There's not really any context to them. It's possible, in part, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus covers all three. In other words, rejoice always, that's God's will. Pray continually, that's God's will. And everything give thanks, that's God's will. But there's no broader context than that. Sort of these standalone, end of the letter commands. Now both Canada and the U.S. have rich traditions at Thanksgiving. In Canada, I'm assuming I can trust, you know, the internet, because whatever's on the internet must be true. <laughs> in Canada, Thanksgiving began in 1578 as Martin Frobisher arrived safely from England as he was exploring and searching for the Northwest Passage. Does that sound familiar? I haven't butchered your Thanksgiving, I hope. But that's where Canadian Thanksgiving comes from. And if you're that far north, any time in the fall, and you're alive, you should be thank you, thankful. So I'm really impressed with that. I feel like our pilgrims were just pansies after what I learned about Martin Frobisher. I don't know why they were complaining, you know, down in New England there. We're, I don't know, 800 to 1,000 miles south of wherever Martin Frobisher was in Nunavut. Is that right? Nunavut. Sorry. All right. I'll get that next year. I'll get it right next year. His European ancestors had similar practices of Thanksgiving long before he was on that ship. In the U.S., as you know, many years after Martin Frobisher, the pilgrims celebrated this holiday in 1621 after a terrible year of suffering uh, and death. In fact, some said that they actually were on a ship getting ready to go back to England when another ship was coming from England with a man named Delaware on that ship, in which we get our state, Delaware. And they were ready to leave. He came over, I'm assuming with some supplies and some encouragement, and they got off the ship and decided to stay. But how should we analyze this character habit that will lead to, that studies indicate will actually lead to happiness? A, a character trait that if you practice it, in a sense, you're manufacturing your own mental health. You are going to manufacture happiness through gratefulness and thanksgiving. I want to look at a few principles here because I think we'd all agree we kind of either are thankful or we aren't. And a lot of things affect that. So I want to talk through that. First, thanksgiving is not an option. It isn't just a feeling that we have and then express. It's actually something that's commanded, and this is communicated in multiple ways in this verse, and I want <clears throat> to break down the text, particularly in this first point. But first, it's commanded. It's in the imperative mode, if you will. It's an action. We're to give thanks in everything. So whenever something's commanded, you'd say, okay, is this something that God would want for me 2,000 years after it was originally written to those first century Christians? Yes. And the book of Thessalonians, there's plenty of people being persecuted for their faith. So I can tell you that the Christians who got this command didn't exactly have things going their way at times. So God commands us to be thankful, which is really interesting because we kind of feel like, well, shouldn't that just be coming from our hearts because of whatever is going on? No, no, no. This is a command. Second, the Bible says it's God's will. Paul, Paul states this. Now, this is really interesting. It's an interesting use of language. It's an interesting use of the term God's will. Because I believe, and I'll do a series on this sometimes and uh, at some point, and then it'll be interesting what, what you think of that. Because Christians really disagree on how to define God's will. And I personally believe, and I'm not alone in this, that modern Christianity has radically altered what God's will actually refers to. So let me, let me take a bite at that here. We use the term God's will to refer to knowing how to make key decisions in life. In other words, if you're thinking about where to live, you know, Dee and I recently got here. We have a house to sell, so we don't have a house to buy yet, but we have a house to sell. But once we sell that house, we'll probably be wondering, you know, where should we live? Where should we buy a house? And a lot of Christians would say, well, you got to determine what God's will is. So they would sort of think through, well, I've got this house and this house and this house, and I'm going to pray about which house God wants me to have, and that will be God's will for me. 
Or if you're a young person, you're thinking, okay, you know, I'm going to go to university uh, and I want to figure out what's God's will for my life. You know, I'm thinking about being an architect. I'm thinking about being an engineer. I'm thinking about being a, uh, in the medical field. Uh, and, and I feel like I should go to university because I want to prepare myself as best I can for life. And I want to know what God's will is, so I'm praying about that. And you often use God's will that way. When it gets a little more complicated, maybe get in your 20s or, or 30s, you're thinking, okay, who should I marry? And you know, there's these two people that I'm thinking about dating. I'm thinking about asking them out. And I want to know what God's will is so he could spare me the rejection of the one where it might not be God's will. And so, you know, you're wondering, who should I marry? I want to have God's will. You've got, you've got one or two kids. You're thinking of having one or two more. You want to know if that's God's will, so you pray about it. That's the way we use the word God's will. And for people who have this philosophy of God's will, they would say, if at every turn you're listening to God and making the right decision, you'll end up being in, in what? The center of God's will. All right, I don't believe this. I don't believe any of that. I believe God does have a plan for us. I don't know that you can always know it. So here's what I would say. Because if you believe in that center of God's will theory, I want to tell you what can go wrong there. Let's say at some point you weren't really listening to God as well as you thought. Do you know where you end up? You end up in the wrong city, in the wrong house, doing the wrong thing, married to the wrong person, having the wrong kids. Some of you got the wrong kids. You got to throw them back and start over. I'm telling you, you were wondering why they were so difficult. You had the wrong children. That's the problem with that very narrow view of God's will. At the end of the day, you know, if you're looking for, you know, I believe there's more. Oh, this is going to make me long today. I'm going to make this really short because I've been really naughty lately and I know it. All right. So I would say there's more of a giant circle. And within that circle are all of God's moral commands. And if you're in that circle, keeping God's moral commands and stay from the outside of the circle where the naughty things are, if you're in the circle keeping all of God's moral commands, then you have choices in those other areas. You can do whatever you want to do with your life. Whatever you feel impressed to do by the Holy Spirit or by your natural gifting that comes from God. You can marry whoever you want to as long as they're a Christian and they're a person of the opposite sex. That's it. That's God's moral will. Person, opposite sex. I can marry them. So if you're a young man, you can marry a million different Christian women. Happy hunting. If you're a young woman, you can marry a million different Christian men. Happy hunting. Enjoy the journey. God's will is that you just marry a person who's of faith. And of the opposite sex, that's it. That's God's moral will. You stay within that circle. You have choices. You can have as many kids as you want. You're within God's will as long as you're doing his moral will. Now, I'm not saying God doesn't have a specific design for your life. Don't get me wrong. I'm just saying I'm not sure we can always figure it out perfectly. And if you have that view and you're off track, you have no hope of ever getting on track again. So, this is not how God's will is used in the Bible. Typically, when you see that phrase, God's will, it's ethical, it's moral, it's staying within that circle of God's commands. That's what's going on here. God's will is for you to be thankful. It's, it's a moral command or an ethical command. 99% of God's will in your life is not where to live, who to marry, how many kids to have, and what you should do. 99% of God's will in your life is, I'm going to do the right thing today, and hopefully God is pleased with that. That's 99% of your life. These major life decisions are 1% of your life. They affect everything, but they're 1% of your actual God's will decisions. Your God's will decision today is, am I doing the right things? Thanksgiving is one of those issues. It's part of the, am I doing the right things, God's will. And what's interesting about this, and this is where it just kills me and it kills all of us, it's also circumstance neutral. Oh, I just don't like that. And if you're human, you don't like it either. Give thanks in everything, every situation, every circumstance, for this is God's will. Not be thankful when you're happy, when you have a reason to be happy. Not be thankful when things are looking up. Not be thankful when you're gainfully employed to your full abilities. Not be thankful when you're well, when you're healthy. Not be thankful when life is good. But be thankful in 
every circumstance. And that's the problem for me. And that's probably the problem for you. Because it doesn't seem to work in hard times. In hard times, I don't want to be thankful because I don't feel thankful in hard times. What's going on there? And how can we get rid of that little caveat? How can we learn to be thankful even when we don't feel like being thankful? Some of you are still stuck on my God's will speech, aren't you? I know. All right. You're wondering, did I marry the wrong person? No, no. Once you marry them, it's over. The decision is made, all right? Now you look next to them, next to yourself. You say, okay, you are God's will for me now, all right? So, that, that, all right, so get past that, all right? Point number two. Thanksgiving reflects my belief in a sovereign God with good intentions. All right, I don't think you'll be thankful unless you get to this point. There is a God. He controls the universe. And he has good intentions for my life as a believer, as a Christ follower. Romans 8, 28. We know that God caught, now this is the context of suffering here, by the way. We know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God. A person who doesn't love God, they may not feel this way. It may not make sense to them. But for a believer, a person who loves God, we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purposes as a backdrop to having a thankful heart we need to have trust that there is a god like this that i believe in a sovereign god who actually has good intentions so paul is writing this into a roman world sort of greek gods roman gods and those gods were sort of capricious and suffering at the hands of a pagan god who controlled fate because they were fatalists in the first century a pagans were so suffering at the hands of a pagan god like Zeus who controlled fate and all of life didn't bring hope. That just brings fear. Maybe I'm supposed to be thankful, but, but Zeus isn't a good god. I just fear him. I fear what's going to happen in my life. But our god isn't that way. He might not always bring good things the way we see them, but he has good as his primary motive and intention suffering in the hands of a loving sovereign god who wants our ultimate good that should give us enough to be thankful for in all circumstances because god has good goals even in suffering even in the things that we find hard to be thankful for god has good goals god is trying to to radically transform our character and my character goal from god is christ likeness now, that's not my goal my goal is no pain. That's what I want out of life, no pain. Now, how am I doing on that? Not very well, you know. How are you doing on that? Probably not very well. The no pain goal, yeah, I mean, sometimes we get that. We might get a few years of that, maybe a decade or two. But then things start falling apart, you know, on our bodies, in our lives, in our relationships. See, God's goal, though, is Christ-likeness, and the best way God can get me to Christ-likeness is when things are falling apart in my life, in my relationships, in my body. So once we get aligned that God wants Christ-likeness and I want Christ-likeness, I'm more likely to be able to be thankful because I believe that God actually is getting stuff done that makes me a better human being, that makes me more like Christ. So when I get to heaven, it won't be such a radical transformation. English missionary Hudson Taylor lost his wife and child while he was serving in China. Two weeks after Maria, his wife, gave birth, the baby died, and Maria herself had little strength remaining. He went to her and he asked, Darling, do you know that you're dying? Dying? Do you think so? What makes you think that? I can see it. Your strength is giving way. I feel no pain. I'm just tired. You're going home. Soon you're going to be with Jesus. And then she whispered, I am so sorry. She knew she was leaving him behind. Hudson looked at her and he gently said, you're not sorry to go be with Jesus. Oh, no, it's not that, but it does grieve me to leave you alone at such a time. God will be with you. He'll meet all your needs. A missionary who stood by said this, I have never witnessed such a scene. As Mrs. Taylor was breathing her last breath, Mr. Taylor knelt down and committed her to the Lord, thanking him for having given her to him and for the 12 and a half years of happiness they had had together. A few days later, Hudson Taylor wrote this. I cannot describe to you my feelings. I do not understand them myself, 
I feel like a person stunned with a blow or recovering from a faint and as yet but partially conscious. My father, God in other words, God has ordered it, so therefore I know it is, it must be best. And I thank him for so ordering it. I feel utterly crushed. Now, his view of God's sovereignty was kind of like Job. I don't know that God made his wife die. She had a disease. Living in a fallen world, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I usually don't preach God's sovereignty in such a way that God is causing bad things, but he does allow them. But just like Job, Job viewed it as coming from the hand of God, even though he allowed it. Satan was the one busting up Job's life, but he recognized God allowed it, therefore it's coming from God's hand. Hudson Taylor had that view. And he thanked God for the 12 and a half years he had with her, rather than being bitter at God for taking her. Where would you go? Where would I go? I don't know if I'd start out with the 12 and a half years. We naturally go to the fact that, God, you could have prevented this. What's wrong with you? Don't you really care about me? Because for you and me, it's about us. But God is about character transformation. Trusting God in all things, that's advanced Christianity. That's advanced character development. I'm not there. Are you? I mean, I'm getting closer, but I'm not there. Third, thanksgiving is an indication that my life's expectations are under God's control. I think this is a huge part of thanksgiving. To me, thanksgiving and contentment as an underlining character trait are closely related on the character scale. Contentment is not active. You don't choose to be content. It's the result of something else. Thanksgiving is active. It demonstrates that contentment has already arrived. When you're content, you're then thankful. Sort of a natural outcropping of, of contentment. Nancy Ortberg writes about this. She said, I worked as a registered nurse for about 10 years before my life took a different direction. One of my earliest patients was a young girl of about 14 who had been in a dirt bike accident. I met this young girl down in the uh, PT department. She's in a whirlpool bath. I'd read her chart before I went down to work with her and had learned that as a result of the accident on a motorbike, her leg had been amputated below the knee. A young girl. Can you imagine dealing with that as a part of her image of herself and her beauty and her future? I couldn't imagine what it might be like to be a 14-year-old girl with part of your leg missing. I introduced myself and we made some small talk. Through the course of our time together, I learned that she was a Christian although she really didn't say much about it. I wasn't prepared for her spirit, however, especially when she lifted her freshly amputated leg up above the bubbling water for me to see, and she said this, look how much I have left. Look how much of my leg I have left. She excitedly told me that since the doctors were able to amputate below the knee instead of above the knee, it was much easier to fit a prosthesis. She wondered how long it would take to heal so she could get started with that. I heard most of what she was saying, but I wasn't really paying much attention. My mind was fixed on that first statement, look how much I have left. Her gratitude seemed genuine. It wasn't denial or a Pollyanna mentality. She knew she was missing a good part of her leg, and she wouldn't have chosen that. But she was so very thankful for this bit of good news. Her spirit made my spirit soar that day. And I had two good legs. In his article, The Structure of Gratitude, New York Times columnist David Brooke notes what he's learning about thankfulness. He said, I think this is true, I'm sometimes grumpier when I stay at a nice hotel. Wow, you paid a lot of money for it. I have certain expectations about the service that's going to be provided. I get impatient if I have to crawl around looking for a power outlet, if the shower controls are unfathomable, if the place considers itself too fancy to put a coffee machine in each room. I'm sometimes happier at a budget motel where my expectations are lower, where a functioning iron is a bonus and the waffle maker in the breakfast area is a treat. This little phenomena shows how powerfully expectations structure our moods and emotions, none more so than the beautiful emotion of gratitude. Gratitude happens when some kindness exceeds expectation, when it's undeserved. Gratitude is the sort of laughter of the heart that comes about after some 
surprising kindness. Expectations wreck happiness and thanksgiving. Expectations. I used to joke about this from the pulpit, so I'll just continue. I used to tell my wife, honey, you want a better marriage? Lower your expectations. <coughs> I mean, it is the perfect recipe for a better marriage. I mean, just be thankful if I show up, you know, if I go to work and provide and do this or that. Be thankful if I'm a nice guy. You know, just lower those expectations. Then anything I do will be like a great surprise that I'm a good guy. You know, that's kind of funny, and it's actually true. Take the marriage part out of it. But anyway, lower expectations in life provide a lot more room for gratitude. But we in Western society have sky-high expectations. If you, we'll just throw the people south of the border under the rug for a second. All right, the U.S., on the world scale of happiness, I believe the last I heard was they were 33rd on the world scale of happiness. Why is that? It's all about getting ahead. It's all about comparing yourself to the person in the cubicle next to you or the person in the boardroom next to you. And if you can't sort of hit the top of the scale, <laughs> your life is wrecked because somebody's ahead of you. And I doubt if we're that much different just because we got a few miles north of the border here. Expectations wreck happiness and thanksgiving. Thanksgiving comes when we learn to say, no matter what our situation in life, we serve a, God, a sovereign God who has our best interests, and we limit our expectations knowing in this life we weren't promised all the things we want, and we learn to say, look how much we have left. Look how much we have. Not look what we want, look how much we actually have left. Look how much, it's not necessarily what I used to have, but it's all I need. And because my expectations are now lower, what I have left feels like more than I ever had before. You go through a hard time. You go through a bunch of cancer treatments. You're happy for a test that says you're in remission. And every sunset looks a little bit better. And the mountains just look a little bit taller. Because you're alive. And you have hope that you'll be alive five or ten years from now. Look how much you have left. And after hard times, you'll have more happiness with a lot less circumstantially because of it. Finally, Thanksgiving is an indication that I know where blessing comes from and that that God who blesses me has me. He's got me. About 3,500 years ago, <clears throat> there were about 2 million Israelites wandering in the wilderness. They'd been in slavery for over 400 years. They'd been beaten, bruised, defeated for centuries. The promises of God to their forefather Abraham were in the distant past, the far distant past, so much so they were barely a memory. And they were not exactly believed anymore. <clears throat> but now God had delivered them. Ten supernaturally devastating plagues, sort of natural disasters on steroids, had had humbled the Egyptian empire. The king of Egypt had been forced by the true God to free Israel, to let them go. And a miraculous fire in the sky led them day and night. The Bible describes it as a fire by night and a cloud by day. I think it's the same thing. It just looks like a cloud, the smoke during the day. At night you see the light of the fire. Now the Egyptian king changed his mind. Didn't want to give up a nation of slaves building his public works projects. And so their army is now pursuing the Israelites to the sea. Israelites aren't used to war. They've been slaves. They haven't had weapons. They know that they are going to be eviscerated in a battle. And then in front of them, as Ro Moses raised his staff, God brought a great wind, and it was a miracle. It wasn't like, oh, the water level went down, everyone went through in the mud, you know, about thigh deep. No, no, no. God miraculously cleared out a sea in an epic miracle that even impressed Charlton Heston in the Ten Commandments. The older people know what I was talking about there. And the Israelites walked through on dry land. Generations of them walking through a wall of water. Little kids, there's a fish in there, Mom. Get your arm out of the water. You know, just incredible stuff. 
People trying to cast sideways, you know. The whole thing was going on. The Israelites walked through. The Egyptian army then thought, hey, seems to be open. Our gods are powerful. They began to walk through as well. And God allowed those waters to recede, to go back to their normal place. And all of the armor that defended those soldiers now became weights around their shins and their bodies. And they all drowned. And as the Israelites looked back, they saw Egyptian soldiers washed up on the land, dead. God had shown up with miracle after miracle and delivered them in such an epic way. We look back at that as perhaps the most miraculous moment in history. Nobody had ever seen anything like it in the history of humanity. At no time since creation and the flood had there been such disturbance to the natural world. It was epic. And then in a matter of days, just days, not Thanksgiving, but I'm thirsty. It's kind of dry out here. I'm a little parched. Soon after that, I'm hungry. Egypt was so good. We had this daily buffet. It was like that sushi thing on McLeod Trail, that sushi buffet. That was Egypt. God solved it. Sent cereal from the sky every morning, quail at night. Soon after, more whining. Why? Why, after seeing the hand of God in such a miraculous way, were their hearts still there and not able to get to thanksgiving and trust? That's a good question in human behavior. Why was it so hard for them? In my opinion, they were conditioned after 400 years of slavery to think that they were on their own. They had long ago given up on God's promises. I mean, if God hasn't delivered for you in 400 years, you're pretty disappointed, right? You know, you ever tell your wife, hey, it's been 400 years and God hasn't, you know. That's not a good conversation. When God lets you down for 400 years, you're not exactly a person of faith, even if you believe in the true God. Miracle after miracle couldn't break the grip of doubt because they felt they were on their own. Because as far as they were concerned, God had been such a disappointment they were on their own. And he's going to disappoint you too. He will. If your expectation is happy all the time and he's always got to come through and he's some sort of giant divine vending machine, you're going to be disappointed. I have been. It was literally even with miracles an uphill battle for God to be believable for them. Think about that. Even with miracles, it was an uphill battle for God to be believable and credible to his own people. Thankfulness took a long time in that nation's history. It took a long time to trust God. Thanksgiving only comes once we know and acknowledge where good things come from. That God is good and that he will be good to us. We have a problem with this in Western society. We're self-made. We believe in God, but we don't really need him much because, you know, we just, we go to university, we go to college, we call it college in the States, we go to college in the States, we go to university up here, we get our education, we do it, we pay for it, or our parents, and then we get these jobs and we provide for ourselves and we make our own luck. Then when good things happen, we might as well thank ourselves, right, because we did it. That's not a biblical perspective. That is a Western perspective. It's not biblical. From ancient Israel to today, thanksgiving is an indication that we get it, that even though we contribute to our success, God has been good. My son was over in Djibouti on an Air Force base that sends off drones to strike terrorists around the world. Best place for a 21-year-old man in the world is Djibouti, Africa. Not a good place where all the Somalian refugees are going as they flee Somalia, just cardboard and tents and people drinking out of the same small rivers that everything else is going into, and horrible. But after a few months there, he said to us, and I'm so grateful for this, I don't have any problems. I don't have any problems, Dad. It transformed his life. He'll never have a problem. He's an ambitious young man, but he recognizes he has no problems. So much of the good in our lives, we had no say in. 
You didn't have a say in the country you'd be born in. We just won the lottery ticket. And we should be thankful. And thankfulness means we get that. Just a couple apps. First, is Thanksgiving a part of your character? When Dee Dee and I were going through this transition, which I described a little bit last week, and there was a lot of heartache in it, we started what we call the gratitude journal. Because we didn't externally have a lot to be thankful for at the time that we recognized because of the pain in our lives, we started writing down what we did have to be thankful for. And sometimes it was the same thing every day. We had some people who loved us, people who reached out to us, who loved on us, and our kids. We have a wonderful family. God has been so good. And if that's the only good thing that I had in my life, that was worth thanking God for in those times. Second is Thanksgiving, or is a Thanksgiving problem actually a materialism or contentment problem? Sometimes it's hard for us to be thankful because we've got expectations that are jacked way beyond anything God ever promised in the Bible. Remember the young amputee? Look how much I have left. I've got enough leg left that the prosthetic will be a, a lot easier to attach. I'll walk better. You never say that if you're a discontented person, and you'll never be thankful. Only hard times can fix that. It's only when, as Paul said, he learned how to, how to be humbled, and he learned, he learned how to be on the highs and the lows. Philippians 4, he talked about that. And being in the low points or low times taught him how to, how to be content. So when we go through low times, it actually teaches us to be more thankful when things get a little better. Sometimes God has to bring us through those times to get us there. And do I know where blessing comes from, God or me? Are you self-made? Are you God-made? A poll taken by the British Nutritional Foundation questioned 27,500 children and youth aged 5 to 16 about the origins of food. According to a summary of the survey in the BBC article, almost a third of UK primary pupils think cheese is made from plants. A quarter think fish fingers come from chicken or pigs. Nearly one in ten secondary pupils thinks tomatoes grow underground. The survey also revealed confusion about the source of staples such as pasta and bread among younger pupils, with about a third of five to eight-year-olds believing they were made from meat. About 19% of this age group did not realize that potatoes grew underground, with 10% thinking they grew on bushes or trees. Isn't it fun to throw another country under the bus when you and I have nothing vested in that? It's not the U.S. and Canada, right? Kids don't know where their food comes from. Do you know where your food comes from? It comes from God. Do you really see a sovereign and good God as the backdrop of your life? If so, thanksgiving is natural. Or you're going to believe foundationally. You'd never say it because you're in a church. You'd never say it. You believe you're self-made, that it was you. It's really easy to get that wrong in Western society because you did do a lot to get where you are. You did, but you did it with the gifts God gave you. Do you know where your food comes from and every other good thing? If you do, let's let him know it. You know, Thanksgiving is an act an action, and after I pray, I want to give you an opportunity to put that action into action. And we've got a couple of uh, setups up here, and we've also got an option on the screen. I'm more nervous about this than I was about the sermon. Just explaining technology for me is sort of a being 40 years in the wilderness. Anyway, so we've got an option here. You can text to this app. You'll see it right up here, this Menti app. You go to menti.com on your cell phone and use the code 347454. You type that in, and then something's going to pop up that says, I am thankful for. And then you just type that in, and at the end of the service, those things are all going to pop up. Now, I think we have to wait till the end of the service to have them pop up because evidently we're losing our mouse back there somehow. So I was given all kinds of directions about how to make this happen, and I'm scared to death I'm getting it wrong. Or... You can go old school. Thank God for old school sometimes, right? Old school for old dudes like me who shave their heads, all right? You go old school, and you were given this little leaf on your way in. And if you weren't given a leaf, that's okay. We've got stuff like that right up here. During the time the worship team is up here, after I pray, the worship team's going to come forward. Prayer people will be, prayer partners will be up here. If you want prayer for something, they'll be right here. Worship team will be up here singing, playing. And as they're doing that, 
old school way would be take that leap you were given on the way in and come forward. There's a bunch of pens here and you write what you're thankful for today and you just pin it on one of these boards here. And we'll just do that during our worship time and our prayer time. I would encourage you to do this as an action. Tell God today what you're thankful for. Because for all of us, for all of us, no matter what you're going through in life, it's look how much I have left. Look how much I have left. God, we thank you for your word. Thank you for this holiday which commemorates thankfulness. And for those of us who know you and follow you, we know that we're commemorating the fact that we believe you have been good to us. And even if we're in hard times, we can say, look how much we have left. And we can also say that we know there's a good God behind this, using even hard times to change our character and make us better people. No matter what, as, as believers, we end up in a place where we should be thankful. Help us to thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.